Um, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to, to Isaiah chapter 64. <clears throat> May the Lord help me finish this book tonight. And as we do, we're, we're not going to be heading into Jeremiah, as we've said. We're going to move into the New Testament, where we have not been for a long time. But that transition will be right into the book of Matthew. Um, I don't think that's a bad transition, especially after being encouraged so much about not only the first coming of Christ, but the second coming of Christ. It'll be uh, refreshing to look at uh, the Lord coming to us and um, to Israel as their Messiah and to the world as, of course, our Savior. And uh, we'll look forward to that. Might not be this next week. I might, uh, I think I'd like to do uh, maybe a prophecy update, maybe just current events and things that are happening and just put that on my heart for this week, but um, then we'll be jumping into the book of Matthew and uh, uh, heading through that. Anybody, uh, was anybody here with us when we were in Matthew the last time? Good, more hands, because that, that doesn't go back that far, and uh, <clears throat> it's great to go through uh, the New Testament again, so... If you have your Bibles there, Isaiah chapter 64, let me pray. Lord, would you help us as we read about your love for Israel, uh, your promises toward them as, as a nation, but Lord, you're, you're, you're pouring out your, your desire for them to, to come to you and to trust in you and to call on you, and Lord, we know that that's not just an individual call, but a, a national call for them. And as we listen to your heart and your love for them and your desire to save them, it's a reflection of your desire to save this world. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't love the nation of Israel more than you love anyone else. Your love is perfect, and that is a picture of your love for everyone. And so remind us of that tonight. It's not exclusive. Your heart beats the same way for each of us that we would call upon you and trust in you and come to you. And Lord, you said you would come, you would answer and you would heal us and you'd forgive us and save us. And so we thank you for that. So minister to us, Lord, as we, as we uh, read the, these chapters tonight. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 64, verse 1, <clears throat> says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. I like that, don't you? That's not a bad prayer. <laughs> I think we could all pray that. Come, Lord Jesus. Uh, we have a pretty good sense that this world isn't going to get itself straight, is it? It's not on a trajectory that is righteous, and uh, consequently, it's miserable to be on this earth uh, when the earth is in rebellion to you. Now, it doesn't mean we can't have joy individually as believers, even in the middle of the storm, but we sure see it happening. And um, this is a reflection of the last chapter that we left in Isaiah 63, where he says, you know, Isaiah is speaking here, and he says, Look down from heaven and, and see from your holy and glorious habitation. Uh, where, where are your zeal and your mighty deeds? The stirrings of your heart and your compassion are restrained toward me. For you are our father through Abraham. Um, it says, um, does not, Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us. In other words, we're not what we should be. It says, you, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from uh, of old is your name. And it was a calling, just like this is, Lord, come. And, and I think Isaiah wanted to say, Lord, would you come now? You know, it sounds like as you're giving me this, it, this could be a while. But, you know, in his day, Israel was a mess. Wicked and disobedient to God everywhere that he looked and with the leadership all the way down. And he was like, Lord, would you just come and, you know, uh, and get us right? And of course, that's not 
the way it's going to happen. The Lord is going to call and stir them to get themselves right. Um, and so he says, as verse 2, as fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to our adversaries that the nations may tremble at your presence. So the deliverance wasn't just <clears throat> from their sin. That's where it should be, is that they needed to be delivered from their unrighteousness and repent and turn back to the Lord. But their, their, their view was upon Babylon at this time, the Babylonian nation, which was a world-ruling nation, and uh, they were under siege. And uh, so, Lord, would you rescue us? And, of course, that's the heart of the Lord, uh, is to re uh, rescue us. So, now, the Lord's not going to rescue them. Uh, he's going he's gonna, to... Uh, call them back into uh, Israel again, but they're still going to be under uh, control and the control of the world ruling powers uh, for hundreds of years because it'll be the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians empire that'll come after that and then the Grecian empire and then of course in Jesus' time it'll be the, the Roman empire and we'll get to that when we get to Daniel. But... Um, this is the idea that <clears throat> Jesus, the response that Jesus wanted when he came finally in the Roman period to Israel and he made, became flesh and dwelt among them and revealed himself as their savior. You know, the response that he was looking for was repentance. That's why he was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now is your chance. You want to call out to me? You want to cry out for deliverance? Uh, now's the chance. And of course, that as a nation was not accepted. And Jesus, um, you know, he wanted them to say, save now, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? We talked about that. That's the cry that he wanted. Now, there were a remnant of people, uh, followers of Jesus that were crying that out. They, they saw him as Messiah and Savior, and they're like, here comes our king. But of course, uh, the leadership of Israel and the heart of, uh, of Israel was uh, unrepentant. And Jesus, of course, said, you're, you're not going to see me again then. It's going to be another long period of time and a lot more misery, which it has been for Israel all over the earth, scattered. He says, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, till you cry out. Now, the Bible's not complicated. What does God want from us? He wants us to turn to Him, to acknowledge what we know. We are not God. He is God. And He wants us to know that He will save us, but we have to turn to Him. Israel, as a nation, is a special case because He not only made promises of salvation, a Savior to Israel, but He made that to the whole earth. But he also made promises to Abraham of the people of Israel of physical, bodily promises uh, that, were, that went on um, in regards to the land that they were living in of Israel. And of course, we know now after studying the book of Isaiah that this was uh, going to be a picture of the kingdom of the Lord. When Israel repented as a nation, Jesus would fulfill those promises. He would come bodily which is called the second coming of Christ. By the way, it's, he's still coming. Um, it hasn't, he he's, hasn't decided not to come. So the earth will know a savior. They will know a king. And this time, instead of a punishment for Israel, there'll be a salvation for Israel. And he'll set up his kingdom and, and he'll punish the nations, the wicked nations, which we see all around us and leaders and all of that. They will be judged and then we'll go into a time uh, where Israel um, serves and honors the Lord, and that's a light to the nations of the earth. And so we've been learning a lot about what's coming in the book of Isaiah. It could have come a lot sooner for Israel. Um, it, it didn't have to do with uh, God saying, no, I'm not going to come yet, I'm not going to come yet. No, it had to do with their heart. And so if you didn't learn anything from this study of Isaiah, uh, hopefully you learned that we're still waiting for Israel to repent, right? They need to repent. 
And if there was a megaphone that I could get a hold of that could speak into the ears of every Jewish person, obviously everybody needs to repent. But there is a time when Israel will finally repent, but it's not going to be till after we're gone as the church. But it'll be in a very distressing time that's coming to this earth in the last days, the, the tribulation. And uh, so Jesus wanted that. So we as believers, we can still feel the same way. Don't we want the Lord to come? But for us, our promise is He's going to come and He's going to take us out of here, right? But Psalm 2 says this, gives an explanation. It says, why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? There's a strategy to all this that's going on with all the nations. They're slowly working and knitting themselves together toward a goal. What is it? It says, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Where's the earth heading? Into full rebellion against the Lord. And there will come a time, which the Bible says, that they're going to know who they're fighting against, God. But interesting, it says, and this is Psalm 2, you can write that down here, it has to do with this passage here. It says, let us tear their, their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Who are they? It's not Israel. There's going to be acknowledgement that there's the God, the Father, and then they're going to also uh, realize that there's the Son, Jesus, as well. And they know that that's who they're trying to break away from. And it says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. Basically, it's saying, are you kidding me? How are you going to do that? The Lord scoffs at them. Then he says, he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me... This is God speaking. He says, I have installed my king, which it talks about his anointed, uh, upon Zion, my holy mountain. So there's an acknowledgement of the father speaking to the son that I'm going to send my son and he's going to rule over all the earth. You're not going to break uh, those fetters. So the nations will recognize both God the father and his son, um, his anointed. So... Um, I won't digress, but everybody knows there's a God because God puts it inside of each one of us. And, um, and he also uh, puts inside of us common knowledge that he must be an awesome, mighty, great, divine God to create all of this and to make us as well. And there's a sense that we're accountable to him. We have a conscience. Uh, and then we know that we'll be accountable to him. Verse 3. When you did awesome things, which we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence, for from days of old they have not heard or perceived by ear. Remember he said, you, you know, Abraham wouldn't recognize this, and uh, we're, we're a shell of ourselves, and now there's an acknowledgement that we've forgotten your greatness It's like we don't acknowledge all that you've done for us to make us a nation. I say that all the time. Uh, if you're a Jewish person of Jewish heritage, why are you, what's, why are you a Jew? Um, you, you only exist because God created you, right? From Abraham came a nation and from Jacob. And that's, your existence um, is only because of a divine hand of God. So if anybody should acknowledge it, it should be uh, you. From the days of old, they have not heard or perceived by ear, nor has I seen a God besides you who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. That's the key. God acts on behalf of the one who waits for him, not for the ones that rebel against him. And so they were, they, uh, Isaiah was calling out for God um, to rescue them like the days of old, to deliver them as he did from Egypt. Now, the whole earth recognized that. Anybody who lived on the earth at that time, there's not anybody who didn't realize or understand uh, 
uh, what happened there with this people called Israel in this most powerful place called Egypt, uh, the, ru- you know, the rulers really of the earth, and how God delivered them. It was to God's glory, and it showed that the God of Israel is the God of all gods. There are no gods besides him, and uh, that was a testimony. And they're wanting the same thing to happen again. But as we just said, it's not going to happen now in, this, in Isaiah's time because they won't turn to him. It didn't happen in Jesus' time because they, again, rejected him. But it will happen. And uh, the entire world was shaken by that in Moses' day. And uh, really, in Jesus' time, wasn't the earth shaken? I mean, what, what is the date? Calendar date? It's 2022. 2022 years from what? Right? All of time is measured in that. Uh, there, not, not by chance, because it shocked and, and rocked the whole earth. And uh, God came to us. And, and again, salvation went out to the known world at that time, even in Paul's day. And so ever since then. But we haven't seen an event like that in a while. And so as we study, you know, this coming of the Lord, um, who will dwell on the earth and not know Jesus in the millennium? Nobody. Has the earth ever seen a time like that? Even from Adam's time. See, men used to go out and they met, met with God. That's why Cain and Abel, they, they went out in their time and they met with the Lord. Uh, probably the Lord Jesus, right? And they, and they offered their sacrifice there and there was this, um, you know, fellowship acknowledgement of the Lord. But... Um, um, after the flood, you know, we don't see that at all, that there was a bodily presence of the Lord that people would meet with. Obviously, people saw Jesus in his time, and he was God in the flesh, but not in a way that all of the earth uh, could know him. So it's going to be a pretty big event that's coming. And I suggest to you that the tribulation will be the same. Because it says over and over in the book of Revelation that all of the earth acknowledges <laughs> Jesus, but they don't want to bow down to him. They know all of these things are happening because God is bringing judgment uh, upon this earth, but they, they refuse to bow. In fact, they go on plotting their, their, their evil, right, and, and, and the demise of the Lord. So we really haven't seen that. So they're wanting to see that again in Isaiah's time. Lord, can't you just shake everything up? Can't you just come in and just, you know, take down all of the nations of the earth? Interesting, because the Lord will answer that prayer. But not until Israel, as a complete nation, turns their heart to the Lord. God will save any one of them at any time throughout all of history if they'll turn their heart to Him. Individually, He'll save them just like He saves everyone else. But this is a special event when a nation of the earth, God's people, turn and all the other nations rebel. So, we got that. Verse 5. You meet him who rejoices in doing righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. Behold, you were angry, for we sinned. That's why you were angry. We continued in them a long time, and uh, shall we be saved? Is there, is there salvation coming for us? Um, for all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy, a filthy garment. Paul's going to use that later. And saying that there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. The only way they're going to be saved is if God will remove their sin, forgive their sin. And uh, that's what Jesus is going to bring, right? Forgiveness of sin to all who call upon him. There is no one who calls on your name. Who arouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into uh, the power of our iniquities. Of course, they were thrust out of, of Israel, thrust out of Jerusalem, and now they're in captivity to the Babylonians. And um, so Isaiah notes that is the Israel of his days was definitely not righteous before God. Thus, 
God was not going to come and save them. Okay? So, I think he knows that. Because his divine commission was in Isaiah 6, right? And the Lord said, who will go for us? And there, there wasn't anybody that would go. But Isaiah said, I will go. And so the reflection is the hearts of Israel had really turned away from the Lord. And now he says, verse 8, O Lord, you who are our father, we are the clay and you are potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. Now, we should take note of that. Because we've taken a little bit of time going through this last section of Isaiah to note that this is what Paul is talking about in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Same words, the potter, the clay, um, all of us being the work of your hand. What will you make of us? Uh, will you make us a vessel of, for your honor or will you make us a vessel for dishonor? And as we know, they were a vessel of dishonor. Even at the coming of the Lord, they rejected him, and Paul takes note of that. But God's going to bear with him, isn't he? He can still take a vessel of, of dishonor, and he can make it a vessel of honor, if they will believe on him, right? So he says, Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Behold, look now, all of us are your people." And again, not that the Lord isn't going to save the remnant. A whole remnant of Israel w will be saved and has been saved throughout time. But it's a small remnant. You say, well, why didn't God save all of them? Because not all of them would turn to Him. You say, well, why, why doesn't God save all the Gentiles? Because not all the Gentiles will turn to Him. A remnant has turned to Him. Jesus said the path is wide to destruction but it's narrow the gate, uh, are the gates uh, there because you have to turn to the Lord Jesus. Anybody can turn, but not um, only some will uh, turn. So they're no different than we are. And uh, so can't uh, use them as, as an excuse uh, here. Um, so uh, will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us beyond uh, measure. Did I skip a verse here? I did, didn't I? You have the pottery where the work again. Sorry, verse 9. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord, uh, nor remember iniquity forever. Behold, look now, all of us are your people. Your holy cities, verse 10, have become a wilderness. Of course, that's what it was when they were in captivity. Uh, the land was, became a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house where our fathers praised you has been burned by fire and all our precious things have become uh, a ruin. Yeah, but you didn't care so much about them when you had them, uh, the temple and all of it, because you didn't honor the Lord and, and serve the Lord there. Now you recognize that. Will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us beyond measure? Of course, the Lord isn't going to do that. It's going to offer them a chance to come back into the land. And so he opened the door for their return. Um, but the same passage, um, and you are potter and all of us are the work of your hand. Romans 9, 20 says, on the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Verse 21, this is in Romans 9, it says, or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump? Now, you can underline that, the same lump, because he's going to take some from that lump and he's going to save them because they're going to turn to him, but not the whole lump, right? It says, one vessel for honorable use and another for common use. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And that's not speaking of the Gentiles, it's speaking of Israel. Paul's saying, God has made them vessels of dishonor because of their rejection of the Lord. And throughout history, that's how 
uh, we understand Israel. They're the ones who rejected Christ, right? But before that, um, it was known that God had removed them from their land. And so there was a curse to that. And people looked on them that way. And um, it doesn't really matter the way they see them, but it matters the way Israel responds to God. And they didn't, they didn't repent and they didn't turn uh, back. Chapter 65, verse 1. It's continuing in the same thought. It says, I permit myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, well, who, who, who could, who's going to find the Lord? And, and the Bible's telling us here that God's going to open this up and there's going to be those who didn't seek after the Lord, who Gentiles all over the earth who are going to find the Lord and have relationship with the Lord. And here is Israel, they're not in relationship with the Lord. And it says, and I said, here I am, here I am to a nation which did not call on my name. And this is a good reflection of Jesus and his coming because as he stood there, he's saying, here I am. Uh, can you find fault with me? Have I not fulfilled everything that the Father has done? What do you say? Uh, who do you say that I am, right? And of course, they didn't call on him. They didn't acknowledge him as their king. He says, I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people. He's, he's, he's endured centuries and, and, not, and not seen Israel turn back uh, to God and, and repent and turn to him who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts, a people who continually provoke me to my face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on bricks, and that's, of course, what was happening in Isaiah's time, who sit among graves and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh, and they're breaking the law, and the broth of unclean meat is in their pots. So, Put that in your margin, Romans 9. Again, this is something that we should understand. God has a plan for Israel. Hasn't unfolded yet, but it is going to unfold. And Paul was speaking about that just out of Isaiah. He he says in Romans 9, 22, which we read already, it says, What if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath, prepared for destruction? And then he says, And He did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which this passage is talking about those who did not seek me or um, who did not ask for me, uh, found me. He says, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. So Paul's saying, listen, he has, he's still saving, but because of their rejection, now um, others are being saved. And he says, not just me as a Jew, but also Gentiles are coming uh, to know uh, the Lord. Romans 10, just write that down in the, in the notations there. These are all quotations out of this passage, by the way, Isaiah 65. So Paul was thinking about Isaiah and this uh, word here when he was writing Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Verse 10, he says, And Isaiah is very bold, and he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. And so that's exactly what it's talking about. So it uh, helps us a lot to understand um, it wasn't that God refused to save them. It said that they wouldn't believe on Him. And uh, they could have been saved even as a nation, but they would not repent before Him. But some did, like Paul, and uh, they were saved. Verse 5 in our text, it says, Those who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am holier than you. These are smoke in my nostrils a fire that burns all day long. God was, they were rejecting openly God. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will even repay into their bosom, both their iniquities and their, um, 
and the iniquities of their fathers together, says the Lord, because they have burned incense on mountains and scorched me on the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom. God says it. There's going to be a, I'm going to make them into a vessel of dishonor, right? Verse 8, thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, uh, for there is a benefit in it, um, which usually you would scoop that off, right? Uh, there, I said, no, no, don't do that. There's some benefit to it. So I will act on behalf of my servants in order not to destroy all of them. You wonder why God put up with that, uh, why he didn't just cast them away altogether. They're already all over the world uh, out of relationship uh, with him. But the Lord says, no, I'm not going to cast them away. There's use for them. What is it? Um, it's going to be glorious. going to be amazing. Hard to imagine. But can you imagine all of Israel turning their hearts to Jesus? And trumpeting the name of Jesus as Savior and Lord to the whole entire earth in the face of the earth's rebellion against him and desire to, you know, take out God as, as the nations are in Psalm 2 uh, and, and Jesus himself. And now you've got this nation going, but you need the Lord. I, we're going to get to, maybe we'll get to see that when we're with the Lord because we're going to be taken out and not have to suffer the wrath of God. But Israel's going to be in the middle of it. And the Bible says 144,000 male virgin Jews, God's going to uh, commission them to go out into all the, the earth. And not only preach the gospel to the Jewish people all over the earth, but to the whole earth. And um, he's going to, um, um, through them, bring a powerful witness uh, to the earth. And people have mentioned that, um, but I think that's going to be an amazing thing to see the people who had rejected Christ, now who have accepted Christ, and now saying, listen, you need to repent, you need to come to Jesus. It's going to be powerful. Um, he says, verse 9, I will bring forth offspring from Jacob, that's Israel, and an heir of my mountains from Judah, that's the southern kingdom, even my chosen one shall inherit it, and my servants will dwell there. So, um, just so we can clear up something. God doesn't wish that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. God's not unfair. Um, that's, that's not the God of the Bible. Israel, um, again, has been cut out of these promises here. He's going to bring them back in uh, one day. But it's only because of their rejection. Not because they couldn't accept him. So there are those who read Romans 9, 10, 11. And I think the problem is they're not reading Isaiah because they don't acknowledge that this is about Israel, not about each of us individually. God's not, not going to say, hey, I'm going to choose some for honor and some for dishonor. I'm going to save those who I want to and I'm going to reject those who I don't want to save. It isn't speaking about that in any way. God loves, the Bible says, He doesn't wish that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. For God so loved the world that He gave us and that whosoever would believe on Him. So that's the heart of God. And so this is a good chance for us to really lock that in to our understanding of God. There are those who teach otherwise, um, but I think to their, uh, to the disgrace of the love of God, um, because the key is, and we're going to read this in this next section, it's going to be faith. Faith. Um, Paul's going to go on and say, hey, why, why didn't they receive it? Why did we receive it? And Gentiles received it, but... Israel as a whole did not receive it. So he says in Romans 11, let me read you this section here. It says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. That's Romans 11.1. 1. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Well, those are kind of words that we toss around as if he knows 
foreknows somebody and foreknows, does not foreknow other people. It says, or do you not know that the scripture says in this passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, like basically, God, you need to judge them. And he says, Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. There's you just, just wipe them all out, God. Go, you know, none of them are good. And, but it says, what is the divine response to him? God said, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You don't know. Um, but there are those there who have turned their hearts to me and, and they haven't bowed their knee. It says, in the same way then there um, has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. And we'll see what that means there. But um, there, has, there, was, there was those who have turned to the Lord and uh, haven't turned away from the Lord and accepted the Lord. And uh, you might not know that, but God knows it, right? He says, but if, if it is by His grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it. So we say, wait a minute, some, some of them did obtain it, but the nation didn't obtain it. And the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. So, uh, uh, there's a remnant that believed on the Lord, but the rest uh, did not. Then he goes on in Romans 11.25 at the bottom. He says, For I do not want you, to, uh, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So, why hasn't he saved the whole lump? Because they didn't believe as a nation. The whole lump didn't believe on the Lord. But um, a portion did. Now what's important is, is that we realize that how, are you, how do you become the chosen? How were they chosen? He goes on, he says it, uh, he had said it earlier in Romans 9 verse 30. He says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness. They were chosen. Even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Why didn't they get there? Why weren't they chosen? He says, because they did not pursue it by faith. They wouldn't turn their heart to the Lord. Don't make it too complicated. It's not complicated. The Lord doesn't want any of us to perish. He wants us to turn. But he's not going to make us turn, is he? And, uh, and he waits on us and he calls on us to turn our hearts to him, just like he does to Israel uh, individually and uh, also he would like uh, Israel as a whole to turn. But he says, but as it, though, uh, as it were by works, uh, that's how they pursued it, by trying to fulfill the law. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, um, which was Jesus, and he who believes in him, believes in him, will not be disappointed. So, that's how they became uh, chosen. Um, so, we'll look more into this passage. So, go back to Isaiah 65, verse 10. Faith is the difference be between being chosen or not chosen. You don't become chosen until you trust in the Lord. And then you receive the election and the promises of the Lord, not the other way around. Faith always precedes salvation. You can't be saved until you repent and believe on the Lord. There is no salvation, no, no blessing uh, from God. And um, you can't receive the grace of God until you repent and turn to the Lord for salvation. Verse 10, Sharon will be a pasture land for flocks and the valley of a uh, Acor, a resting place for herds. That's a little place that's down by uh, Jericho when you go to Israel. Um, it's interesting when we come back from the Dead Sea, we go by, you know, where Jericho is down there um, by the, um, 
um, Jordan River, there we go, uh, and you start up toward uh, Jerusalem, and you make that you know, turn there, and you start heading up, and what you always see every time as you go up is all these hills on the way up, and I remember the first time seeing it as I looked out there, and there were tents, big, huge tents, and parked outside were Mercedes, and they had satellite dishes on them, but they were tents. They were better ones. And what were they doing? They had huge flocks of sheep. And that's what this is, uh, that same area of Achor, a resting place for herds. Uh, it says, for my people who seek me, and which is by faith. Verse 11, but you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for um, fortune, and who will... Uh, and who fill cups mixed with wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword, and all of you will bow down to the slaughter. Because I called, so they were called, weren't they? I called you, but you didn't answer. I spoke to you, but you didn't hear. And you did evil in my sight, and chose that in which I did not delight. Paul is in no way speaking in Romans 9, 10, 11 that there's some divine thing by God that he's decided before time and he's went down the quarter of time and said, I'll take, you know, Johnny, Susie, Billy, um, but not Kathy and, you know, Tom and whoever. Uh, not at all. The Bible says the same thing over and over and over and over. He calls on us. He convicts us. He reveals himself to us. And, uh, and we have to turn to him and believe on him. That's how uh, we're saved. But that wasn't a choice that they made, but everybody gets a choice. So salvation is and always has been received by those who choose to believe the word of the Lord. Israel's problem wasn't a divine plan of God to say, I, I'm just going to cast you away because I don't like you and I don't want you to be saved. No. No. It's because they would not turn to him. They would not receive him and accept him. God will make them righteous, are chosen, as Paul says, um, by, their, uh, by faith. In other words, if they'll turn to him. So whether Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, the way of salvation comes the same way. There's not a God of the Old Testament, a salvation of the Old Testament in one way, and a salvation in the New Testament of another way. It's all the same way. Um, now the salvation is complete because of Jesus. But before we trusted in God to save. Um, and um, uh, um, ahead of time. And that was true for. You ever wonder that? Was God only trying to save Israel? No he was reaching out to the whole earth. Just like he will in, in the millennium. Uh, testify to the whole earth of who, uh, who he is. And so um, we, we come by faith in the Savior, and then we receive this undeserved, unmerited grace. So those sins can be forgiven and removed, and then we're not at aught um, uh, to the Lord. Now, I know this is lengthy, but I want you to turn with me to Romans Chapter 1, we're still in Romans. This was the theme that began the book of Romans, and he went into talking about all the beauty of salvation through all the way through chapter 8. But then in chapter 9, he went back to what he started with, was that what about Israel? So why did all these Gentiles get it? Romans 1 verse 17 says this, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now you can turn to Romans chapter 4 if you're flipping in your Bibles. It's continuing the same idea. It goes into the whole thing. Men knew the truth, but they rejected the truth. Uh, and they believed their own lie. And God turned them over and all of that. Explaining uh, what's really happening. You knew it. You're accountable to it. You know better. You know who God is. Even the Gentiles do. But uh, they reject that truth. Romans 4 verse 3. It says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as 
righteousness. So how did Abraham become right with God? By believing him, by putting faith in him. That's the same way everyone is saved uh, throughout the Old Testament and now into uh, the New Testament. Things haven't changed, have they? Um, same requirement. It says, verse 4, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. So if that was a work, if faith was a work, then you'd just be getting what you earned. But it isn't. Um, it's, um, again, um, um, a pleading for grace before the Lord. And what you get is what you don't des- deserve or what you haven't earned. Uh, and that is the grace of God. Verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as Davis, David, and think about this, David understood this, didn't he? He was a sinner, wasn't he? Just as David also speaks of the uh, blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. How is David going to be forgiven of what the sins he had committed? He said, David said, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. He said, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? This is Paul writing. He says, For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteous. Nobody doubts that because the Bible declares that. Then verse 10 he says, Well then how then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Hmm, That's an interesting question. Was Abraham circumcised when God credited to him as righteousness, faith? He says, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Um, That circumcision didn't come till after he had placed his faith on him. Because he says, and he received the sign of circumcision, he became circumcised as a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. So that he might be uh, the father of all who... Believe, all who believe, which we know is going to be a father not only to the believers of Israel, but to believers all over the earth. That was the blessing that God said to him. Without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also uh, follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. Of course, that, this was helpful to, to the Jewish people at the beginning of the book of Romans. But it was also helpful to the Gentiles reading it because they realized, hey, do I got to get circumcised now to be saved? And he's saying, no, 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 you're not saved by your circumcision. You're saved by faith. Uh, your faith is what's saved you. Abraham was saved before he was circumcised. Verse 13, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be the heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Again, just bringing home that to us. Everybody's saved the same way. Israel's not going to get a special salvation here at the end of time. They're going to get saved the same way. They're going to turn their hearts, repent, look on him whom they pierced, and they're going to believe on the Lord. And the Lord's going to save them, not just spiritually. They would have already been saved when they believed on the Lord, but he's also going to rescue them bodily and physically as a nation uh, to set up his kingdom. So, Romans 4.22 says, Therefore, it was also credited to him, Abraham, as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written um, that it was credited to him. In other words, it wasn't, he didn't earn it. He just got it as credit. But for our sake also, to whom it will, will be credited, as those who uh, believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. I'm almost done. Uh, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction. How did we obtain this? Salvation being chosen by the Lord, all of that. 
It says, by faith that we entered into grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Um, Paul writes uh, again, last verse here on this uh, subject, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. He says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves, for it is the gift of God. It's the credit of God, right? Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. So nobody gets to boast of their salvation because I'm a Jew or because I'm circumcised or because I'm religious or because I do all these things, right? Um, it's only because you trusted in the Lord and what you received for salvation was by grace and you didn't earn any of it. So faith is not a work, correct? Now, there are some who say, This passage, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, they read this passage and they say, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And they say this, and this is important. They say, the gift that is spoken of here is not grace, which Paul's, what Paul's been talking about. You're gifted, credited righteousness because you believe. But he says, no, the gift is faith. So, what do they mean by that? What they mean by that is, is that um, if you're elect of God, He will give you faith. He'll make you believe, right? It isn't your choice or for you to choose to surrender and the will goes away. And so, it's a, it's a result from reading Romans 9, 10, 11, and Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, with that lens there that um, has rejected Israel and the fulfillment of God's plan for Israel. Because Paul isn't talking about individual salvation in Romans 9, 10, and 11. He's talking about salvation of Israel as a people, as a nation. When he's talking about the vessel of honor and vessel of dishonor. He isn't talking about He's made some for salvation and made some for dishonor. It's important to understand that because it's not the God of the Bible, right? He's a God who has given every man an, uh, this measure of faith. Every man can choose him or reject him. And that's what makes the Bible the Bible. Um, can't digress any more than that, even though I'd like to. But... Um, thought that was me for a second. Okay. Salvation, this plan of God, what God's doing with Israel here in Isaiah, it's not complicated. He just wanted them to turn their hearts to him. He wanted to save them. Um, he would gladly save them now and give them all the promises that he would desire to give them, but they need, they need to turn uh, Jewish people are being saved all over the earth, you know, praise the Lord. There's a remnant that's coming. You might know believing uh, Jews and those who've come to faith in Christ. Um, and they're being saved the same way all uh, the Gentiles are being saved. Um, but what this is talking about, Romans 9, 10, and 11, uh, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, as he's speaking of here, is uh, when he's re referring to circumcision, uncircumcision, faith, uh, all of that. Um, he's saying, listen, um, that's, that is, um, th those are two different things. And so God doesn't have a plan to reject anybody. Uh, he wants all to come to know him. And um, now that we've read the book of Isaiah, we know, okay, um, that helps me understand uh, these difficult passages for some. But they're not difficult when you read them in light of what we're learning in the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah. Um, he can choose to take this nation and, um, and their rejection and make them vessels of dishonor, but he can also choose by his divine plan to bring them back in and make them vessels of honor. And Paul says, "Don't God's not done. He's going to make them vessels of honor. It, it, the day will come, but the fullness of the Gentiles will come in first. And of course, we're still in that day. Um, the great salvation and turning of Israel will happen um, in the tribulation. So uh, don't be uh, deceived. Verse 13. 
we finally made it back. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servant will eat, but you will be hungry. Behold, my servants will drink, but you will be thirsty. Behold, my servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. Why? Because you've rejected me. But the remnant of Israel, I'll bless. And he, and he always has. Behold, my servants will shout joyfully with a glad heart, but you will cry out with a heavy heart. And you will wail with a broken spirit. You will leave your, um, your name uh, you will leave your name for a curse to my chosen ones, and the Lord God will slay you. But my servants will be called by another name. Interesting because a lot of Jewish people have come and gone over the course of history. I, I don't know how many millions upon millions. And the majority of them have rejected Christ. In the last 2,000 years, uh, they have, they have not uh, believed on their Savior. Um, and uh, there will be no salvation for them. But those who do turn will be blessed. The interesting part of what's coming now for the nation of Israel is God's going to put them in a position where, where uh, they will turn their hearts uh, to him. And so at the end of the tribulation, the only ones left are going to be those who are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, and then God says, I'm going to make you a whole new nation. Remember, we learned that God's going to make a new covenant with them. And not a new covenant of salvation, another way of salvation, but a new covenant, he says, with them. So in the millennium, everyone's going to see Israel a whole different way than they see them now. They're going to have a whole new character or name there. Uh, they're going to be known for righteousness. And for walking and obeying the Lord. Just like I said with 144,000, that'll be a force that the whole earth will recognize. Boldness and love for uh, the Lord. And God is looking forward to that day for them being a testimony to the whole earth. Verse 16, because he who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth. And he who swears in the earth will swear by the God of truth. Because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from my, uh, my, my sight. So he's going to give them a new start as they enter the kingdom. Verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Now, this is interesting because it's going to sound like we're in the eternal state here. Uh, a new heavens and a new earth. But I don't, I don't think it's saying that. I think what he's saying is the heavens and the earth will be in a new state when Jesus is reigning over everything. <clears throat> Reason why I believe that is, is because he's going to go on and describe this time. And uh, part of that time, people are still going to die. And that's not going to happen in eternity. Um, so he'll dissolve all of this and actually make a, a brand new heavens and earth for eternity. But there'll be no more death. It'll be swallowed up. But in this passage, it's not, it's not uh, swallowed up. So, um, but the Lord will make the earth. It won't look the same. And uh, bodily, uh, physically, the earth's not going to look the same either, which is going to be awesome. Uh, he's going to do away with the mountains, right, and the islands and all of that. So the topography of the earth is going to be different. And uh, everything is going to be new. And, um, and same with the nations and all of it. It'll be something the earth has not seen. Verse 18 um, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for the rejoicing and her people for gladness. Like we said, it's going to be new. <laughs> now when you think of Jerusalem, you think of Israel, you think of righteousness and them serving the Lord. Brand new. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And therefore will no longer uh, uh, be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying Israel will no longer be in that state <clears throat> of desperation and uh, that their wickedness brings to them. It won't be known for that anymore, but for joy. Verse 20, no longer will there be in it an infant, this is pretty interesting, who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days. That's pretty interesting. People aren't going to die quickly. 
And it'll be really rare that if somebody, an older man, doesn't live out his days, or you don't die at an old age. Well, what's an old age? He says here, for the youth will die at an age of 100. But even if they die at 100, it says here, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. So, if somebody dies at 100, it's like, oh, they died so young. That's what it's saying. They, they were just a child. A hundred. Just a child. In fact, when they die in, in this time of the Lord, in the millennial kingdom, um, if, they, if they died at a hundred, something's fishy. Why? Because you're not supposed to die at a hundred in this time. So maybe they were a curse. And the Bible goes on and says that. If somebody is rebellious in, in the kingdom of the Lord, because people are going to be born to the earth. There'll be a, a righteous start of believers in the earth, but they're going to have children, aren't they? Probably a lot of children in a peaceful time, a thousand years of peace. A lot, a lot of babies are going to get born, right? And so, but if they come up and they're born and they are rebellious to God and defiant of the Lord, uh, because that might happen because they didn't go through all of the things that the earth has, has seen. And the Bible says God will take them out. <coughs> be a judgment. So they'll, they'll say they, there must have been a judgment, and, and that'll probably be right, right? <clears throat> Verse 21. Um, they will build houses and, and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. In other words, Israel too. No one's going to take over their land. They will not plant and another eat, for as as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. <clears throat> How long do trees live? Pretty interesting. Trees can live a long time. When you go to Israel, you go to the, um, the, the Mount of Olives there, and you see the olive tree, and there's some of those olive trees that are this big around. And they say... And I know historians will say as well, they're well over a thousand years. And uh, some of them lived longer. Some of them, they say, might have even been here at Jesus' time. That's how long uh, that they've lived. And of course, some of those uh, trees as well. So I, I don't think it'll be uncommon for people to live all throughout the entire thousand years uh, of the Lord. <clears throat> uh, and my, my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, uh, for they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. And it will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and uh, while they are still speaking, I will hear. Now, that'll be the case for the whole earth, but a special blessing we'll see. He's talking about uh, Israel. <clears throat> Verse 25, the wolf and the lamb will graze together. That's interesting. Would you put a wolf in there with your sheep? You wouldn't now. Why? Because that's a wolf's going to do what a wolf's going to do, right? And this is, and the lion will eat straw. Okay, um, not their choice diet at this point. Uh, they'll eat straw like the ox, so they'll change their nature, right? And dust will be the serpent's food, and they will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain. Uh, says the Lord. Now, I know we only have three minutes left, but I'm just going to read this last chapter. It's just pretty glorious. It's really a culmination of everything. Um, the Bible Knowledge Commentary says, as the climax to the book, this chapter fittingly describes the millennium, the time toward which history has been looking, which was promised to Abraham. All of us have been waiting uh, the earth has been waiting to see this day. Let me just read it here in closing. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all of these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word, saying the Lord is going to choose to dwell with us, right? Speaking of Israel here especially, not 
We're going to be in heaven with the Lord. That's our home. But he's saying the Lord doesn't need a home. He made everything. But he's going to make his home uh, here and dwell here for a thousand years. Pretty amazing. Verse 3. But as present, basically, he who kills an ox is like one who slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. Uh, He who offers a grain offering is like one who offers swine's blood. He who burns incense is like one who blesses an idol. And as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so I will choose their punishments and I will bring on them uh, what they dread. Because I called, but no one answered. By the way, they could answer, but they didn't answer. I spoke, but they did not listen. And they did evil in my sight and chose that in which... I did not delight. And he's saying, this will never happen to an Israel that is like you are Israel, right? Verse 5, hear the word of the Lord. You who tremble at his word, your brothers who hate you, who exclude you from, uh, for my name's sake, have said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but uh, they will be put to shame. Uh, they don't have a true heart for the Lord. A voice of uproar from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who is rendering recompense to his uh, enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. Who has heard such a, of such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? He isn't talking about um, the uh, the. Um, birth of Jesus, right? It's not saying he didn't have a father. It's saying, how could you have a child before you have labor pains and uh, go through all of that? Um, It says, can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. He's saying this is, it's going to happen so fast, your head's going to spin because in one day, the Lord's going to establish an entire nation And it's going to happen. Uh, No travail, no troubles, no anything. One day when the Lord returns, he's going to come to a people that are waiting on him. He's going to save them and establish uh, that nation. Shall I bring to the point of birth and not give delivery? Says the Lord. Or shall I, uh, I who gives delivery, uh, shun the womb, says your God. In other words, I'm not going to fail to deliver this. Look forward to this. This is going to happen. Be joyful with Jerusalem and rejoice for her, all you who love her. Be exceedingly glad with her, all you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied with her comforting breast, that you may suck and be delighted with her bountiful bosom. Basically, if you're living all throughout history and you're not seeing this happen as a Jewish person, but you're a believer, you're longing for it, just know it's coming. Just know it's coming. Rejoice. It's coming. For this, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream, and you will be nursed, uh, you will be carried on the hip and uh, fondled on the knees as one uh, whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. Then you will see this, and your heart will be glad, and your bones will flourish like new grass, And the hand of the Lord will be made known to his servants, but he uh, will be indignant uh, toward his enemies. God's going to say, in that day, I'm going to judge the enemies of Israel and put them down in one day. And he will. And uh, for behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. You can count on it. He's going to do it. For the Lord will execute judgment by fire and his sword on all flesh and those slain by the Lord will be many. Uh, I'll rescue you one day. Those who sanctify and purify themselves to go to the gardens, following one in the center, uh, who eat swine's flesh, detestable things and mice, who will come to an end altogether. I'll put all of that down. For I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, not just Israel, but all the nations of the earth, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them and will send them survivors uh, from them to the nations, Tarshish, Put, Lud, Meshach, Tubal, Javan. Some of those are enemies now. Uh, To the distant coastlands, uh, um, 
that have neither heard my fame nor seen my glory, they will declare my glory among, among the nations, uh, and possibly the 144,000. Then they, will, they shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord on horses and chariots, in uh, litters, on mules, and on camels to my holy mountain in Jerusalem. And we just talked about that. The earth will now rescue the Jews and they will bring them to the Lord in Jerusalem. Says the Lord, just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, I will also take some of them for priests and for Levites. Not just the Levites, but all the nations of Israel will become priests of the Lord. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will uh, endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure and it shall be from the new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath. All mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. The beginning of the kingdom, there will still be all of those who were slain by the Lord. For their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched. And they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. It might not be a blessing to you, but to Israel it will be. Um, because all those evil uh, um, people stand against God, God's going to smote them. It'll be a good thing <laughs> to put down all those who hate the Lord. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you. These promises are amazing to us. Can't even picture an earth where you dwell. You're the maker of all of it, and yet you're going to come and dwell uh, on this earth, and uh, Lord, we're going to get to rule and reign with you, the Bible says, and you're going to take us and give us glorified bodies, and we're going to come and serve uh, as priests with you as well, and, but we're looking forward to seeing an earth that is peaceful, and nations that are obedient and uh, submissive to you. I know you'll rule with a rod of iron, but it's going to be beautiful, a little taste of heaven, uh, not quite heaven yet, but a beautiful place. And this earth, I know, groans for that time. And we groan for that. Um, it's sad for us to see what's happening on this planet. It's dark. It's wicked. It's vile. It's evil. It's the pain and the suffering that goes along with it. So we say, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Uh, your coming for us, Lord, is also uh, fantastic. But we know it's right before your second coming to this earth. We love you. We give you praise tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.